when our economy uh, was in great shape before going into this. We had uh, one of the lowest debt to GDP ratios of uh, most of our comparable countries. Uh, and that left us in a great situation to be able to make the necessary investments to see us through this the right way. There will be a time after this is all done, as we figure out how exactly this unfolds, uh, where we will have to make uh, next decisions on how that recovery looks. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau there was asked if there was a limit to how much the federal government can spend on COVID-19 pandemic on their COVID-19 pandemic response. There are eye-watering numbers in a parliamentary budget office report today on the cost of emergency benefits announced so far. The federal deficit that report says could hit more than $250 billion this year. So how much more can the federal government spend and how much political capital will the Liberals have once the final bill comes due? The Power Panel is here to discuss. Rachel Curran, former Director of Policy to Stephen Harper and Senior Associate at Harper & Associates. Uh, she joins us from Ottawa, I believe. Uh, Andrew yeah. Thompson, uh, who works for Government Relations for the University of Toronto, former Saskatchewan Finance Minister, is with us as well. And David Hurley, host of the Hurley Burley podcast and partner in the Gandalf Group. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. Hey, great to see hey. you. It's so nice to see everyone so healthy, and I appreciate you being with us. I wanted to talk a bit about the enormity of uh, not just the crisis, but the response from the government. We got some figures from the parliamentary budget officer today. We were just talking, I was just talking to Stephen McNeil, the premier of Nova Scotia, who was arguing that there needs to be a, a sort of different and maybe even bigger response for essential workers in his province, because under the current construct of what the federal government might do, it might not even end up helping essential workers. It won't even work out to be a top up. When you see those figures, David, I'll start with you. $250 billion deficit, uh, obviously <clears throat> revenues depleted. This is just a whole, since the last time this power panel was to get together, it's a whole new world. It is, and it's a world that nobody has ever seen. It's completely uncharted territory. The government has had to craft this rescue plan out of whole cloth. And, um, you know, what I'm struck by is obviously the deficit numbers are staggering. And, you know, I'm from a world where $45 billion seemed like an enormous crisis for a deficit. So 250 is a big, big number. I, however, have not talked to an economist who did not think this was necessary, even those on the conservative side of the spectrum. And this is happening all over the world. Um, most economists think that our debt to GDP ratio was manageable enough that this is, if this is a one year, $250 billion deficit, it's easily manageable. If it's two years, it's still manageable, but we do need to start whittling this down and that's gonna be the challenge. Yeah, Rachel, certainly that will be a challenge. I wonder also uh, a lot of economists talking about what David said and then also saying, you know, eventually we're going to have to start thinking about what the future looks like and how you end up dealing with it. Obviously, the issues are so acute right now. It's not happening at this moment, but eventually there will have to be thought put to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it is necessary to spend this money right now. It looks like a huge amount of money and it is. I don't think anyone's arguing that we don't need to spend it now. Um, but look, when we were uh, dealing with the 08, 09 financial crisis in the Harper government, I have said before, one of the most difficult things after that crisis was to bend the spending curve back down again uh, and to return to balanced budgets. And that's gonna be the challenge for this government too. Um, this isn't sustainable over the medium to long term. So eventually we will need to think about uh, what happens after this crisis, assuming we can even identify an end point to this crisis, which is the other issue. Andrew, the, the other thing that stuck out to me, just jumping off what Rachel said is, and I apologize, I'll have to interrupt you probably in a minute just to reset the program, but is that, uh, you know, this is just an estimate right now. We don't actually know even what will be recovered in the economy in four months. It is gonna be uh, difficult to, to divine what's, what's coming. I think the government's been smart uh, in terms of how it has put together these uh, uh, subsidies. These are definitely crisis subsidies. They're different than what, say, Premier McNeil was calling for in terms of uh, top-ups uh, that may, in fact, stay within the system after that. But uh, uh, the ability to pull these back once the economy starts to reopen, uh, restart and recover, uh, I do think is there. The question is, uh, you know, how long we can continue to spend like this. I would argue that now is not the time for half measures. 
uh, that the government should be spending what it needs to to make sure Canadians are protected right now. I'm going to interrupt you for one second as we fade to black. We'll be back in just a moment, though. You're watching Power and Politics. Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos. This is Power in Politics right here on CBC News Network. We're streaming right around the world on CBC's news app as well as cbcnews.ca. I'd like to welcome our viewers joining us on their local stations in the Maritime Provinces. Great to have you with us. You're joining the Power Panel. We're just in the midst of a discussion on uh, the government's measures so far, the government's responses so far. Andrew, I, I cut you off so rudely there. I apologize. But you were in the middle of saying that uh, sort of half measure, this isn't the time for half measures. It's not the time for half measures. This is definitely a time when the government's got to be putting the full force of the Treasury uh, to work to support Canadians. For those of us who have been critical of the deficit spending that's gone on over the last three years, uh, I do think that, uh, or for those of us that are frankly just more pure Keynesians, the belief is that when your economy is growing, you should be saving for rainy days. And you know what? It's pouring. Uh, now is the time that they've got to be making sure money is available to, uh, to get the businesses restarted, to be able to protect workers. Uh, to be able to make sure that the economy is structurally sound as we come out of this. Uh, and they're going to have to work closely with the provinces to make sure that we uh, have a seamless restart uh, to whatever the economy is going to look like after this. David, uh, one thing I've been thinking of and anxious to talk to the power panel about is what it might look like, on, and, and all of you have experience, on the inside, on the other side. We're reporting from the outside on the measures that are being taken, the response to them. What what do you think of the sort of enormity of the challenge or the enormity of the task before the government to try and respond to this completely unprecedented event, the magnitude of what their response has had to be, how quickly they're, they're supposed to move? How, how, what, what, you, what might you imagine it's like behind the scenes? Well, I think that the biggest flaw in the government's response to this was in um, the slowness. And by the by slowness, I mean, they were a week or two behind uh, in something that was moving at lightning speed. So it's really not a criticism. But the point I'm making is that on things like the wage subsidy, they initially said, we'll do 10%. And everybody knew that was clearly inadequate. And the CERB was pretty restrictive. And I, what I'm pretty sure happened is that the Department of Finance sees its job as controlling these expenditures, sees its job as damping down the enthusiasm of spenders in the government, and also probably had a difficult time broadening its imagination to what was going on. So I think what it's been like on the inside of this government, first of all, full credit to all the officials who've worked night and day to roll out seamlessly programs that nobody ever heard of before. So this isn't a criticism of officials, but it is, I'm sure, the political levers of the government, political staff, ministers, the PMO, that had to kick the, the bureaucracy, particularly the Department of Finance, into getting with how big the magnitude of this response needed to be. Rachel, you referred to 0809, and of course there there had to be a big response then. Obviously, we thought at the time it was huge. Now it seems small compared to what's going on now. What was yeah. the process like behind the scenes there, and and how uh, how 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 did you deal with the challenge at the time? Yeah, I mean, look, this is unprecedented. I can't. I can hardly imagine uh, what it's like at the moment. I mean, 2008, 2009 seemed like a real scramble. Uh, we had to rewrite a federal budget uh, in a matter of weeks uh, to respond to a crisis, roll out stimulus spending, 54 billion odd dollars in stimulus spending out the door and do it as quickly as possible to try and mitigate the impacts uh, of the recession then. I mean, this is on another scale altogether. Uh, it is almost uh, unimaginable. It's certainly unprecedented. Uh, look, I do agree with David. There has been an incredible um, amount of work done, good work done behind the scenes to roll out these programs. I, I, look, I think decisions are probably having to be made without all of the necessary information uh, sometimes. That's just the pace at which things are moving. Uh, so I so I hear him when he says that Perhaps certain programs initially were not broad enough in scope or not properly targeted. 
But I think that's, you know, uh, that's that's a sort of necessary function of operating at this speed. So I think Canada as a whole has done really well in that respect. I think our economic response uh, has been quick. Uh, it's been targeted uh, to the right people in the right direction. Uh, money has gotten out the door quickly. Um, so I have very few criticisms in that regard. Uh, I think the bigger issue honestly, is what we were talking about about before, which is, you know, uh, how do we get out of this? What is the exit strategy? Speaking of the exit strategy, if you're just joining us now, we're here with the power panel. And on the uh, side of your screen, you'll see a box, uh, a shot there inside uh, the Edmonton legislature. We are anticipating Alberta Premier Jason Kenney alongside public health officials to announce the rollout plans for that province's reopening of their economy. Uh, Andrew, you've been in the position, mm -hmm. finance minister of a province. Talk a bit about uh, how this might work now. Uh, jumping off what Rachel said, the idea of all provinces figuring out when and how to reopen their economy and, and what kind of role does the federal government play in all of that? Right, so so this is gonna need something of a, a line of sight. I wouldn't say it's a coordinated response. The federal government doesn't have a lot of uh, tools in its toolkit in terms of when the economy restarts. It's gonna come down to what's available for, uh, you know, how the provinces are feeling and, and when they're gonna start easing up on their restrictions. So it's gonna be very lumpy and asymmetrical as we go through this. What's going to be critical is to make sure that we have a federal response that matches that, that as some sectors start to pick back up, that the government is able to step in and help out those that are not. What I think is different than 2008, 2009 is that we have essentially flash frozen the economy. 08, 09 was a massive disruption. There was so much structural damage that had been done by the banking crisis that it was unclear what you could actually count on uh, to be there after the fact. There's going to be a lot of pain and a lot of hurt coming out of this, especially for the small business sector. But the key institutions are still going to be there. And that wasn't certain in 08, 09. Nobody was quite sure how strong Canada's banks were or how well we'd weather a storm internationally. So we are in a better position that way. And if I can just make one other point, and that's that we have been, and I we have spent very little time talking about this uh, you know, as a community, we have been well served by the parties that are in the parliament and the fact that we have a minority uh, government right now. The fact that the liberal government has been responsive to changes, the fact that the opposition parties have been you know, creative in terms of what they've been able to identify for gaps and proactive in terms of pushing for those to be filled have made these programs much, much better. Uh, and I think that we really have benefited from the fact that uh, the politicians of all parties are listening to what stakeholders have to say and trying absolutely uh, as imperfectly as, as it is, trying still to make sure they can get the, uh, the issues addressed. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, uh, David. And I'm thinking just even of the student legislation uh, that was passed by the House yesterday, it was given to opposition parties. They have the system now where they give the legislation in advance to opposition parties. They, the opposition parties criticize what they, wanna, what they think the gaps are. The government adapts the legislation and then reintroduces it and, and is able to pass it. That's happened in three instances so far. Well, I think that we're entering into a new phase of this in many respects, and one of the ways it's going to be new is in the politics of it. All governments all over the world, with the exception of Mr. Trump, are bathed in a halo of how they have handled this crisis, and every government's approval numbers are way up. And that is because they have been competently implementing a policy, difficult as it was and remarkable as it was, they've been implementing a policy around which there was complete unanimous support for the idea. And so all the parties have been working together. They've had different ideas, but within the same framework. Going forward, that is not going to be the case. There's going to be no consensus around any of the issues about opening up, what businesses open up, what the rules are, and then economic policy going forward, whether it's austere fiscal policy to deal with the debt or whether it's expansive fiscal policy to try to deal with the personal debt crisis that exists in this country – is going to be all subject for big debate. So this government halos are over and they're back into, very quickly, they're going to be back into a competitive environment. How quickly do you think that happens, Rachel? Uh, I would say, Vashi, probably in the next month or two. I agree with David's analysis here. We got shocked by these crises on the economic front, on the health front, 
everyone pulled to their, together very quickly, and I think productively to address them. Uh, we'll see that consensus start to fray, I think, over the next month or two. Um, also, as hardship really hits home uh, and it becomes apparent that uh, no, what, no matter what the government does to try and support people who have been laid off or lost their jobs or support businesses uh, that have had to cease functioning, um, the government cannot prop up the economy indefinitely. Uh, so there will be hardship to come. There will be additional pain to come. We still don't know that we're out of the woods on the health front. Uh, will we see a resurgence of this virus in the fall and the winter? Uh, th that's perhaps worse than what we've seen already. Uh, we don't know any of that. Uh, so I think this era of cooperation is going to uh, disintegrate um, almost certainly over the next month or two. Speaking of that, Andrew, we're about to head to Alberta, as I mentioned, mm. and we've seen, you know, premiers who normally are at odds with the federal government and even specifically with the prime minister. Everyone has put aside their differences, and I'm thinking specifically of Doug Ford, for example, or Jason Kenney. Uh, it, it seems to be thinning a bit in Alberta's case. We heard um, Premier Kenney express a bit of frustration about uh, some questions around what more help might be offered from the federal government for the oil sector and, and by extension, Alberta. What are your thoughts on the federal response so far to the crisis Alberta faces on, on a number of fronts economically? So we are going to see these cracks that were, were evident before now become giant chasms. And this is going to be a really tough issue to square up. The fact that we are, especially in Alberta, but uh, other oil producing provinces like uh, Saskatchewan and Newfoundland, uh, seeing this cratering of the, uh, the oil sector at the same time we're going through a shutdown of everything else uh, is devastating. And I think the big question will now be, as we move out of the health crisis, and I think we are you know, on the other side of it, let's hope we are. The question will be which voices start to rise to the surface. There are a huge number of uh, Canadians who are have been, you know, living marginally uh, in terms of what they've been able to afford uh, because of the, the high debt that they've incurred, because of the uh, uh, service nature of the economy, the low minimum wages. These are all going to sit on one side demanding more and more uh, uh, attention. And on the other hand, there are the large industrial sectors that are also going to be needing to uh, to have attention paid to them. This is not going to be an easy uh, set of issues to knit together. And I think that's where you're going to see the provinces in particular take up a lot more of uh, differing causes uh, competing for attention with the federal government. That honeymoon, David, that we were talking about federally exists in the federal provincial level too, as I was mentioning. Uh, do you agree with Andrew that that, that honeymoon will come to an end? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think all the issues, as, as Andrew said, I think uh, all, all the issues reemerge uh, that were there before. And Alberta, uh, Alberta is in worse situation than it was when things were hostile between the Trudeau government and the Kenny government before. Uh, there are so many crises going on in Alberta right now, it's hard to keep track of them. Mm -hmm. I do think in the particular case of Alberta, though, it, you know, this issue about help for the oil sands, and, and maybe Rachel can, can help me with this, she might, be more, uh, might be more current with it, but I haven't seen anybody propose anything precise in terms of assistance to the oil patch. I've heard a lot of comparisons to the 2008-2009 bailout of General Motors um, and Chrysler, but as Paul Booth pointed out on Twitter, the government federal and provincial took equity stakes in those companies when they provided them with financial assistance, when they bailed them out. And I haven't heard anybody in the Alberta oil patch that is prepared to accept government ownership of their businesses in exchange for financial help. Yeah, no, I, I, my only, um, the only thing I've garnered, and Rachel, I'll get you to jump in here about what the specific ask has been is uh, an extension of s some sort of backstop where credit is concerned. And, and the finance minister has been on this program and said, even for large companies, that's, uh, that's not something they've ruled out. In fact, they might even intend to do that at some point. There's just been no specifics offered, offered or a timeline. Anything you want to add to that, Rachel? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, what these companies need is a bridge through the current crisis. And the best way the government can do that is, is offer a credit backstop, um, make sure that liquidity exists, make sure that these companies survive 
uh, to carry on another day. Otherwise, we see our energy sector disappear almost entirely, Vashi. It's 10% plus of our GDP. Um, I'm frankly uh, surprised that the government, federal government has not already rolled out a, a, a more robust protection package. Certainly in 08, 09, the Harper government acted very quickly uh, to save the auto sector in Ontario uh, when, when those jobs were in crisis. I would expect the federal government uh, to do the same thing now, but, but you know, uh, there's been little evidence of any action so far. Well, they have... There's a big a question, though. Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, Andrew, yep. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think there's a big difference, though, between where we were at in 08, 09, in that people that uh, are really needing the help right now aren't the big corporations, and I think people are tired of seeing the handouts to the big corporations. The fact that it's the folks who are working the rigs and in the service sector that hit the curb uh, as the price went down, not the folks in the head offices, uh, and certainly not in the executive offices, has kind of left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. And I do think that there is going to be a different kind of sense about how much money should go into bailing out corporations versus should be going into protecting uh, workers and citizens. And that's really bubbled up to the surface. No, no, Alessa, I disagree with that entirely. The, the federal government I'm has rolled surprised. out enough. <laughs> Finally, it was getting to be too nice for a while there. I was thinking, what's well, going on? Look, the the federal consensus government, is done. <laughs> Yeah. As I say, it's rolled out a number of measures to support, protect workers, and I think that's a good thing. Those workers need jobs to go back to. Uh, so it's the industry itself. It is companies themselves that need support right now. Uh, otherwise, those jobs won't be there. Um, you know, those workers will be on government support indefinitely because they will not have work to go back to. What's interesting, though, David, and I want to get your perspective on this, is I've listened very carefully to the prime minister's answers on this. And he is very specific in the way he describes the help the federal government feels it should be lending to people in the oil patch. And he does constantly characterize it as help for workers. They refer, for example, to the wage subsidy, which some oil companies and oil producers have taken advantage of. They also already offered a b more than a billion dollars in aid for uh, cleaning up abandoned wells, which also will employ people. Like, there, there is a way that it's, they're characterizing it. There's got to be some sort of political calculation uh, being made at this time about the optics of, even if it's just extending credit or backstopping credit, of helping out big oil companies? Well, I'm, I'm sure there is. Right. That's for David. Uh, Sorry, let's da David first, and then I'm I'll sure. go back to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there is. I mean, most Canadians um, <clears throat> would probably not agree with Rachel. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong, but most Canadians would probably say, you know, I still don't understand why we would be pouring billions of dollars into support for the oil industry when I thought we were supposed to be getting off of this uh, business. I thought we were supposed to be getting out of this business. And there is a huge constituency in the country and a huge constituency of the Liberal Party and you know, of Mr. Trudeau's that believes that we should be getting off of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. So as he is trying to provide support to that industry, whether it's through pipelines or whether it's through this kind of direct assistance, he has to constantly find a different cloak around which to message it so that it is somewhat acceptable to many of his voters. Rachel, I think you want to respond. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, look, of course this isn't popular. It wasn't popular when the Conservative government had to take a stake in GM and Chrysler, too, to try and prop up those companies. Um, you know, we had to do it because the U.S. was doing it. Uh, President Obama was doing it. And if we hadn't acted at the time, uh, those jobs would have gone south to the U.S. and they would never have returned. Um, so, so I get that it's perhaps not the popular thing to do to bail out big corporations. Um, but you do what you got to do to keep industry alive, to, to function another day and to provide those jobs to workers another day. Interestingly, though, Andrew, we haven't seen the government yet address, for example, another big industry that is essentially asking not for I don't know if bailout's the right word, but for massive amounts of help, the airline industry. Right. Like they, they have right. yet to address any of the big corporations that need help, because that, too, optically even though it's necessary for jobs, probably isn't going to go over well with a segment of, of, uh, of, the, of society. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I do think that this is really going to be the crux of how the recovery is going to work is where does that investment go to? Does it go to just trying to rebuild what we had uh, in this flash frozen economy a few months ago? Or do we, in fact, accelerate out uh, to deal with some of these new industries that are emerging? And I think that what you're going to see Ottawa respond with, and I'm hearing it in uh, here uh, in Ontario as well, 
a lot more thinking about what a new industrial policy for the country looks like. That the you know previous paradigm that's been in place uh, with the existing industries uh, needs to be rethought. And we've got to think about what's going to be next. It's the classic skating to where the puck's going, not where it's been. Rachel, you're shaking your head. No, I mean, I don't know what these new industries and new jobs are that uh, Andrew's referring to. Maybe it's this mythical green economy that the government keeps trying to convince us exists. Uh, the reality is we've got to try and hold on to as many of the jobs that exist currently as we can. Uh, otherwise, we are going to have unemployment on a scale that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. Uh, and that's but, not only going to be bad for Canadians, it's going to be very bad for government, government revenues and all of the programs that we need to fund with those revenues. David, what do you Most of that say? unemployment is because we've shut down the access to small businesses being able to work in the retail and service sector. Let's just be upfront about what that number is. And that's why this uh, CERB program, the, uh, the benefit, right works at such a low level because those are the employees that have been most uh, adversely affected. I apologize. I'm so sorry. I have I have to end the discussion because the premier has just stepped up to the podium. I'm very sorry. I was going to be brilliant. nice to be back. Be I'm sorry. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much to our power panel this evening. Uh, David Hurley, Rachel Curran and Andrew Thompson. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.